Welcome to this video on sustainable economy in which I want to discuss the competition for land area between food and bioenergy and biomaterials production on the other side. This video is part of a video series on our successful future in which I want to talk a little bit about different aspects that are relevant for our sustainable development of humanity into the future with well-being for everybody. The questions that I want to ask and answer in this video are food or fuel? How will the competition between food production and feedstock generation for bioenergy and biomaterials work out? Competition for land area? And what are the consequences for our well-being? I'm, I have been using a variety of literature and databases to uh, work out the corresponding scenarios. It's on the one hand side the IPCC data on the illustrative model pathways, then the United Nations World well Population Prospects, the BP Statistical View of World Energy 2018, and the FAOSTAT database on foodstuff and um, land area use, and finally the CO2 historical data uh, from the CDIAC database. These links are all publicly available, so you can get the same data and do the same simulations if you like. The, if the, uh, it's written too small so they, that you can't see it in the videos, the slides will be uploaded to my university website and there you can have a closer look at these resources. Now, why do we need to discuss about this competition between a uh, foreland area for food production as well as bioenergy and biomaterials production? And that can be seen if we look at the number of undernourished people according to the United Nations uh, statistics as a function of time. And we see how that developed. And we see also, so the blue are, blue are the historical data. So there has been a certain decrease from 1 billion to a little bit more than 800 million people. We also see that there have been these UN Millennium Development Goals that have been announced here. Then actually there has been an increase in number of undernourished people and then a decrease. Currently it's increasing again, even though the UN Sustainable Development Goals have been ratified. And they claim that we want to go to this point uh, within, so reaching full uh, food supply for everybody by 2030, where you can see actually it's unbelievable. We won't be able to reach that point if we do any things as in the past. If we want to get here, we have to change fundamentally, and that is actually at the moment not foreseeable. So getting from here to there is not really likely to happen, even though that has been announced as a goal. I personally think it's unrealistic if we continue at least as we did in the past. Now to understand the system a little bit better on the global scale. I have plotted now the food supply in kilocalories per capita and year as a function of the population. Uh, so horizontally we have the population sorted out country-wise and vertically we have the per capita supply which means, so the per capita means per person, so taking the overall value divided by the number of people, so you get the average value per capita. That means now if we have here the per capita supply, for example, for China times the number of people, then the area in this rectangle is the overall food supply that we have in China. In China. And we see that there are three major countries that we can directly see here. It's India, China, United States, Germany is somewhere here, Belgium is somewhere over here. Belgium where I'm currently living. This diagram includes also two additional lines, namely in red the fraction of undernourished people and in blue the fraction of obese people. And you see actually that as the per capita calorie supply increases from right to left and the countries are sorted such that it increases from right to left, we see that the number of or the fraction of obese people is highest if the calorie supply is high. And we see that the uh, number of undernourished or fraction of undernourished people is increasing uh, towards the lower end, so the lower uh, um, amount of caloric food supply is available in the countries, the higher is the degree of undernourishment. And here we have to see that this is now the global average, around 2,800 kilocalories per capita and day. And actually, we, if you want to avoid undernourishment, if you want to feed everybody properly, then we have to shift these values up to some higher values. And if you want to decrease obesity 
in these countries here we have to decrease that maximum value a little bit so that we will possibly wind up in the end somewhere around 3000 kilocalories per capita and day for everybody also taking into account that we decrease the waste or the losses of foodstuff on the one hand side and that we reach a better distribution globally speaking. So I think that around 3000 kilocalories is a good estimate for full uh, complete nourishment for also suitable for nourishment for everybody um, taking these other effects a little bit into account. That's one end, that's the, the food stuff. On the other end, we have also to discuss bioenergy and biomaterials, and this is, I try to explain it with this diagram. We see the contributions of the three fossil resources that we are using, crude oil, natural gas, and coal. And 4% of, of this feedstock is actually used as a feedstock for the petrochemicals production. And that is that fraction that we presumably need to uh, substitute with biomaterials, so bio-based materials. Another option is to use the CO2 from the atmosphere, activate that or collect that, activate that and do chemistry with that. It's possible in principle, even though it has not yet been shown on the largest scale that that is really feasible. Also, one has to say that some of the primary energy that we are using has to be used presumably also as some or the energy is currently used as a liquid and we will also have to use it as a liquid in the future. For example, if you want to fly an airplane, you need kerosene and we currently don't have any other technology available than using liquid fuels for that. And they also would need to be produced from biomass or from the CO2. So on top of this 4%, we need at least 2.5% of that. I didn't plot that here, but that's 2.5% which is currently used as um, uh, f uh, plain fuel. On the other hand side, also some chemical processes need to be run uh, with fuels because they require a so-called reducing atmosphere for also for steel production. We need carbon. So we have to get to get that carbon some, from somewhere, from bioenergy or from CO2. And in this video, I would especially like to focus on this bioenergy or biocarbon that you want to use. The Balances that are set up and solved are always on the global scale. So this is the system that I'm regarding. I take always global averages and global numbers for everything. And in order to build up the scenarios, I make certain assumptions and they are collected here. I continue the trends from the past more or less linearly in the into the future. Sometimes I add a quadratic term in order to account for certain effects. We will see that in just a moment. I need, I account for a slow increase of per capita kilocalorie supply as just discussed so that everybody can be fully nourished. Uh, increase the agricultural productivity linearly as projected from the past. Also intensify the animal production. I will show a slide on that as well. And I assume that 10% of the primary energy will be bio-based in the future. So the 2.5% for the airplanes another some percent for the chemical industry where they will use that energetically and materially, steel industry and all these things. And I assume that that is 10%. But it will always be explicitly visible. So if you should have a different opinion, you are simply able to scale that to your own opinion, that fraction that is required for the substitution of primary energy. Now let's look at the individual things that are considered. First of all, we start out with the world population, which is, which is driving everything. And as discussed in the corresponding video on world population, there is on the one hand side the high variant and the medium variant, which are published by the United Nations Statistics Department. Reference is given here. And I work out in the video on world population that this may be the probable range with which the population will develop. And actually this very high variant is quite likely to occur. So we need to take that into account and consider that as being one of the likely cases. Most of the literature actually refers only to the medium variant, but I argue in my video on world population why this is actually quite likely to occur. Now we look at the different behavior. On the one hand side, the food supply in kilocalories per capita. And as I said, I assume that we reach somewhere close to 3000 kilocalories per capita a day around the mid middle of the century. So uh, that's the trend that I use for the scenarios. 
Then also I need to account a little bit for the animal versus vegetable food or plant-based food. And there one sees during the last year, so it has been constant throughout time, so this is the fraction of animal-based food calories versus time. We see that that stays quite constant, but then starts to increase around 2000, and that has something to do with the development in China. So there the development increased, people accessed more animal-based food, and I assume that that behaves like that. So there you see uh, leveling off towards the middle of the century to some reasonable value. To compare the data, we can take these data here and we see indeed, so that's not the same, but now country-wise, and we see that indeed for China it has been relatively low and then increased in the 1980s and of course then around 2000 it became, so to speak, dominant on the global level, so that that then uh, developed like that. For uh, European countries that's on the decline, United States is on the decline as well over time. We also see that India also starts to increase slowly a little bit and of course Doing a projection about that is, of course, reading the future, which is actually not possible. So I'm using one behavior, as I've shown in the previous slide, to discuss that as a basis. Of course, we can see if you have different opinions, again, you can see directly what will be increasing or decreasing. Then I said that I want to assume that the uh, plant area productivity, so the land uh, area specific productivity is increasing, so the calories produced per hectare of land, or in this case the kilocalories per square meter and year that are produced. And I evaluated that on the one hand side for the seven major crops we are using for foodstuff, for our nutrition, as well as feed for the animals. These are these uh, values that I, these plants that I have, uh, crops that I have used. And if you evaluate that, that's a very linear behavior. If you look at all other trends, this is really strikingly linear. The overall primary vegetable productivity behaves like that. And if you deduce from these two the remainders, so vegetables, so cucumbers, salad and whatever, then it behaves like that. So these are the historical data and that's the projection, so to speak, into the future. Actually, I try to separate these two behaviors and account for them individually, but it turns out that that doesn't really work out. So what I'm using is actually this red uh, dashed curve here for the overall vegetal primary productivity, so the primary products. Primary products in this context means that things, those things that are really uh, collected on the land area, for example, oil crops, which are then converted into plant-based oil, which is then finally becoming the, the, the food stuff. Uh, so I'm using here this first plant that is collected from the land area and that productivity is accounted for here and that increases over time with this linear function. Of course, assuming that that will be continually increasing at that rate is a challenge in demand. It, it asks for continual increase in land area specific productivity in agriculture. If that should sometime not work out like that, we have a problem. But I assume that it's behaving like that. Second aspect, of course, with respect to foodstuff is this animal part. And there I plot now two parameters which are derived. On the one hand side, the land area that I need per animal-based product calories, so it's the square meter per calories, where the square meters are the pastures, uh, mainly uh, also meadows, it's not distinguished in the, in the, in the statistics of the pastures, more or less per animal-based calories, so how much calorie-specific or animal-specific land area do I use, and then the feedstuff versus the animal-based food stuff that I produce, so it's calories uh, per calories, and it's all food stuff, so all products that are used here. And there one sees actually the world development in this uh, colorful uh, line, colored relating to different times. So that's the process proceeding in time. And we see that in the recent years it developed like that and I simply continue that trend also into the future. Currently we are using roughly two kilocalories of feed per kilocalorie of animal-based food product. Usually very high values are um, uh, announced or discussed in the literature, 5 or 10, but that's actually only with respect to meat. But a large fraction of the animal-based products are milk and egg, or milk products and egg, and they contribute a large fraction. If you take that into account, the global value, so to speak, then you wind up with 2 kilocalories of feed per kilocalorie of animal-based foodstuff. 
For the land area, you see the world is here, Brazil is here, Argentina is here, Europe and Germany are much lower. Germany is extreme. I assume that that is too extreme because we have uh, sustainability issues with the very intense animal production. So what I assume that is towards the end of the century, we will be reaching roughly EU level of land area specific intensity globally. So Argentina, Brazil have to come down to this level by the end of the century. If that is manageable, I don't know. If it's not reached, then of course animal-based food will presumably increase in price, but that's the scenario that I'm using. So it's simply again continuing the trend from the past. To put that into a little bit larger relation, uh, why is the world here if big countries are somewhere over here? And that can be understood if we take the same diagram more or less, the same plot. But now this in red is the previous diagram. This is the scale that in previous diagram. And you now see that there are other countries, the size of the dots again relating to the amount produced, which are producing large amounts of animal-based foodstuff and which are much higher with their a land area that is used and also a little bit higher with respect to the uh, kilocalories feed that are used per kilocalorie animal-based foodstuff produced. So this puts this previous diagram into more perspective. So there are countries somewhere over here that shift everything a little bit to the higher values at the moment as compared to Europe and Germany, for example. So now we get an overview over those things that are used in order to get some idea how the things may develop into the future. Now let's look at the results. This is one of the results. It plots the land area in million square kilometers per time. Historically, this are the, to the left of this white line, these are the historical data for arable land, meadows and pasture and forests. Of course, there is more land area available, that on which we are living, cities, streets, industries. And then there are deserts or permafrost regions that's coming on top of that. So there are many more million square kilometers that are available, but this is the, that area that is in principle accessible to produce some biomass on that, which then can be used at the moment at least. So that's what's available at the moment. And you see actually the overall trend is a little downward. So we are expanding our other regions, uh, mainly where we are living, so to speak, streets and so on. So that's increasing. So why the, that's why the overall area is decreasing. But that trend is not dramatic, so it's not of major importance. For the future, I have now attributed the different land area to the different uses. So it's plant-based food, this is biofuels, combustion, also for chemical industry. I mentioned that previously for reducing atmosphere. So this is for combustion, biomass for combustion, biofuels, biogas, whatever. Biomaterials, assuming a certain quantity of biomaterials that we need per capita corresponding to the today's consumption. This is for the feed and this is for the pastures that we need for the animal production, animal products production. Okay, and this is with the high population variant and the challenging energy scenario. These both are discussed in more detail in the corresponding videos on the energy, sustainable energy transition and on world population. The climate goals of 1.5 degrees centigrade will be reached with this scenario. But what we see actually is if you follow this line, this white line, which, dis which distinguishes the future development, the distinction between forest and pasture. So if we take this line, so to speak, continue that in the future, then we see actually that we need to extend the agriculturally used land area into the forest. If we want to feed everybody, as discussed before, with a high fraction of animal-based food and of course also have these energy scenarios with the high population variant. So if we do that, we are forced to cut down forests and convert them somehow in agriculturally used land in order to uh, develop sustainably and well-being being for everybody. One can discuss things back and forth. Of course, we cannot use, of course, use these forests also for biomaterials and biofuels production, but actually the carbon stored in that forest is less than in the forest that we currently have, which means actually cutting down forests and using even using that economically is negative for the climate. So we want to avoid that. 
also we realize that we are pushing, so to speak, the limits. We are always operating at that limit and even uh, crossing that limit, which means we are pushing the uh, agricultural productivity also always to its limits, as I have discussed before. It's always pushing the limits to the very extreme. This is the same diagram, but I want to have this way of uh, representing it for the following slides. And this is now the same land areas, but now per capita. So now I divide by the number of people. And we are currently using somewhere of the order of 7,000 square meters of arable land and meadows and pastures. So that's the area on which we currently produce our foodstuff. 7,000 square meters for everybody of us. 7,000 square meters, roughly corresponding to one international soccer field. The rest is the same as before, the contributions, and we again, of course, here also here see that we have to cut into the forests. Now, why I want to plot it like that is that on the next slide, I want to show the same, but for the median population variant. For the median population variant, of course, the per capita demand is the same. So the right here is remaining the same down here, only a very slight shift because that influences the sustainable energy transition a little bit. But overall, this demand side is the same. But the supply side is increasing because with the median population variant, we have fewer people, which means per person, there is more land area available. And so the available land areas, they will increase. The demand will stay the same. Now I switch forward and you see this is more or less the same. Switch back again. So these lines are more or less the same, only the supply side is increasing. There is a slight shift, as I said, also somewhere around here because uh, we are with the median population variant reaching a different, slightly different climate goal a little bit earlier and that shifts the curves a tiny little bit uh, sideways, but it is a minor shift. Now for this median population variant, we realize that until roughly 2060, we are still at this limit. So until that time, for the next 40 years, we are still pushing the limits of agriculture, of plant-based production as well as animal-based production, putting it to the limit where I said that's really extreme to intensify, for example, all the animal-based foodstuff production. And as I said, by 2100, if we continue like that and want to decrease it like that, we reach globally the European average level, which means Brazil and Argentina and these countries have to increase their animal-based production intensity significantly, which is possibly not foreseeable. Man will see how that works out. But beyond that, after 2060, there is some more land area available. It's also shown in green here. So we can use that for afforestation, bioenergy use, whatever, increase biodiversity by leaving the land area untouched or whatever. So only then we are able to um, have additional land area. And now in order to look at another possibly a little bit extreme scenario, I assume that we will shift together with a sustainable energy transition also to just plant-based food. And that means of course that the feed production and pasture that we need is decreasing up to the same point here. The plant-based foodstuff production has to increase a little bit apparently, but we see that for Starting from today, more or less, the land area available for biomaterials, for bioenergy, afforestation, biodiversity, that's increasing, continually increasing. And this shows a little bit the major parameters that we have. It's on the one hand side, the population growth. There we saw, let me switch back. I don't like to do that actually, but I want to show it here. This is the high population variant, always at the limit medium population variant at the end of the century, 30% of the land area additionally available of the agricultural land. And if you switch to plant-based food, huge amounts of land area available essentially starting today. And there we see that these are the major drivers. And this also puts into a little bit relation the assumptions that are made. Because if you assume that for the bioenergy, for example, Instead of the 10%, we have only 7.5%. It's a change like that. You will hardly see that. If for the biomaterials, you think, well, we need a little bit less, we can save a bit. That will change that a little bit. Compared to these changes of the major drivers, that's marginal. So I think that this simplified scenario construction leads to a very direct visibility of the major drivers. And the major drivers are apparently the population, how that will grow, as well as the way in which we produce our food. 
concerning the food, I need to mention two things. On the one hand side, I want to show why that is so, why it is actually so inefficient. And that can be seen on the one hand side with respect to land area. This is the arable land which we use to produce plant-based foodstuff and feed. This is the large fraction of land area that we use for pasture and meadows. Also for the primary production, so the first plant-based stuff that we generate, this is for the feed and this is for the plant-based foods. And both of these things are built on this bit of, uh, produced on this little bit of land area. And then from this large fraction of feed, we only produce that little fraction of our final food calories that we are using. So we are using additionally this big part of the land area, this part additionally, so to speak, from that land area for the feed production to get this small fraction of animal-based calories. And that's, of course, totally inefficient. So we see that we have a very inefficient system to produce animal-based uh, foodstuff. It's one thing. Secondly, of course, there are directly some complaints. Why, how can we change to plant-based food? The first thing it's usually said is, well, how about the proteins? And there we see, have to see actually that in the past, again, the protein supply is shown here per capita, again, capita and day. In gray or in shaded here is the recommended range by the World Health Organization. So that's some of the range that is required. And we see the largest fraction is actually of the proteins is plant-based and only a smaller fraction is animal-based. And if we now substitute the animal-based food stuff by plant-based food instead that we have to consume instead, so say seitan, uh, um, tofu or whatever. There are many options. I'm vegan, so I know that there are many options. We will be able to cover that uh, range quite well, actually, and supply enough protein for everybody also on a plant-based level, directly without any, any problem, actually. So that shows that plant-based food is quite beneficial for and a nourishment of everybody because we have more land area available. We can produce more to feed everybody. And we see also that bioenergy and all these things, biodiversity are directly reachable. All the goals are reachable without any problem. Now the question is, of course, are there workarounds? Can we nevertheless stay as we are, reproduce as we do and still have animal-based food and nevertheless make it? And there are two things I want to discuss, only two options more or less, I want to ask for workarounds. One is to use genetically modified plant plants. And I want to show this for the GM maize for the United States, because as you can see, the fraction of crop area for GM maize in the United States has been increasing from 1996 to roughly 2010 to almost 100%, well, around 90%. In the last 10 years, it stayed more or less constant somewhere between 80 and 90 something percent. And the resistances have been, have been introduced into that, so that's now uh, insect and herbicide resistance. So actually you would expect that the um, production is more stable, more constant, less uh, affected by climate, for example, and, 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 and uh, insects, so it's a more stable result. And also, of course, it's easier to reach higher productivities. That's what you would expect. And if you look at that, actually, you see, compare that to Germany, red United States, uh, blue in Germany, where there is no GM uh, maize available. And you see, actually, if you follow the past and the future, the trend is the same for both in the past, of course, that's for sure, but also into the future, actually, you see the variations, so the fluctuations, the influences by detrimental effects is more or less the same, even, well, this is a little bit exceptional for the United States, possibly, but you see that the fluctuations as well as the trend are the same, especially in these last 10 years, where you have almost 100% GM maize in the United States. So there is no benefit from GM food with respect to the overall productivity, at least, with those effects that have been introduced into the plants in the past. Possibly they can be different in the future, but from the past we don't see any benefit of this GM food. Second thing I want to look at, which is also sometimes discussed in, well, not really literature, but in some uh, publications, um, it's the CO2 variations that occur and the CO2 uptake by the plants. Can't we, in, the question is actually, can't we increase the CO2, the, the plant-based productivity by having lots of CO2 in the atmosphere? And the question is, can we answer this, that question if that makes sense or not? 
And we can have a look because if we see here that we see actually there's a yearly fluctuation, an annual fluctuation of the CO2 in the atmosphere. The reason for that is actually that in the northern hemisphere, which is driving, there's more land area, we have the plants which in summer build up, they grow in the spring, uh, the weeds or the weeds for example, and the trees, they build up their, their leaves. In autumn, everything decays, so to speak, and the CO2 is released into the atmosphere. Since the northern hemisphere is driving, that is pushing, so to speak, the CO2 concentration up and down. In next spring, it's taken up again. In the winter, it's released again. And of course, the magnitude of that shows a little bit about the, how should I say, the efficiency or the amount of CO2 recovered by all the plants that we have, the weeds and the trees and everything. So if we evaluate that uh, difference between maximum and minimum in one year, we get an idea about the productivity of biomass. And of course we can attribute that also to the CO2 concentration and see what we get. So if we take this productivity expressed in the annual CO2 variation in ppm versus the CO2 concentration, we get a trend like that, a clear upward trend, which indicates more or less, if we can can even as an engineer we can fit a straight line through that. We see that actually the more CO2 we have, the more the annual uptake of the CO2 by the biomass actually is, which means more CO2, more productivity. Yes. But if we assume that, we overlook something, namely that we are there and we are influencing the system. And we are influencing that in two ways. On the one hand side, we have increased during the same time the primary vegetal productivity, as I've shown previously, which means we are more growing more crops, which we then eat in wintertime. Also, we have become more people, so we have more people to eat that, release that afterwards on the toilet. And then, of course, that produces CO2 and is released into the atmosphere as well. So that is contributing to the CO2 in the atmosphere as well. It's increasing because we are getting more people, eating more stuff and uh, also the per capita consumption has increased. Also the heating increased, so we are using more energy for the heating. This is only the fraction for the heating and of course we are heating in winter, we are releasing the, the, the energy for the room heating preferentially in the winter uh, to a lesser degree in summer that also leads to a certain fluctuation that adds to the fluctuation that we see in the atmosphere. And if you add these two you see that slope is not exactly that, but of a similar order of magnitude. So this slope that we see in this annual fluctuation in the CO2 in the atmosphere can be well attributed to anthropogenic effects that we create by increased vegetal productivity and fossil heating. So unfortunately, there is no benefit by having more CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not foreseeable that that occurs. And actually, there are studies on that. Some show that actually the productivity only increasing the CO2 may increase slightly. But they also show that especially for so-called, well, for C4 plants, it doesn't have an effect. But for C3 plants, for the experts, it Actually, it's counteracted by some uh, effects because then the uh, other uh, the sugar producing steps are a little bit uh, slowed down possibly. So there are uh, effects that compensate, so to speak, uh, with the vegetal productivity if the CO2 concentration increases. On the other hand side, it's argued that, of course, as the CO2 concentration increases, climate situation gets worse, gets hotter, and that also decreases the productivity. And you have to see the combined effect, and then again, the overall productivity of the plant is possibly not increasing. So that's not of a benefit, or at least we don't see any significant benefit from that. Now we are at the end of this video, so we can conclude. So there are no workarounds, and we see two things. With a behavior change, fewer children, only medium variant, and only vegetal produ production, uh, vegetal food, available technology allows sustainable well-being for everybody. Full nutrition for everybody, biodiversity, everything is possible. Without behavior change, high population variant, and large fraction of animal-based food, the technologies are continually pushed to their limits or, alternatively, there are more people undernourished or we have to cut down forests, which is detrimental to the, uh, to the climate. Which means, in turn, if you compare that, actually the change in behavior is essential. It's not a question of technology. It's a question of behavior. If you see this comparison, it's just behavior, which is important. Technology will not get the push 
a sufficient push or a sufficient effect in order to overcome all our negative behavioral things. Concluding, to feed the world, change in behavior is essential. Maximum two children per family, exclusively plant-based foods. This is not extreme, of course, extremely formulated, but I mean, uh, one can argue about that for hours. Which means if you want to reach that, especially the two children per family, we have to support the less developed countries in order to develop so that quite automatically the number of children per woman will decrease over time. Nevertheless, there will be a strong competition for the land area between on the one hand side the feedstock for biofuels and biomaterials and the food production. That is unavoidable more or less. Which in turn means that the land area demand for the feedstock to produce bioenergy and biomaterials is an essential criterion for the selection of the corresponding process routes. And that's actually what I will use, that insight I will use in discussing then the options that we have for this bio-based energy and materials production in the corresponding video. For this video I would like to say thank you and I hope to see you again in one of the other videos of this series.